Hello, friends. Welcome back to English Classes Online. My name is Benjamin. In today's video, we are going to look at Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. And our focus will be on the major themes. We are looking at the major themes in this amazing piece of literature. And if you are new to this channel, kindly subscribe to the channel by clicking on the subscribe button below. Click on the bell icon as well, so that whenever a new video goes live on this channel, you will be notified instantly. Without much ado, let's dive into the lecture. First, a look at the themes of this novel at a glance. Number one, we have love and passion. Number two, abuse and aggression. Number three, revenge. Number four, social class. Number five, conflict. Number six, the theme of death. And number seven, belief in the afterlife. In the afterlife, that is life after death, if you like. So we are going to take this one by one, beginning with love and passion. This is a great theme in the novel. The novel is about romantic love and passion, how passionate such love could be. Now, Woodering Heights portrays love and passion as dominant aspects of human behavior. The love between Heathcliff and Catherine begins with great passionate, uh, you know, passionate fondness for each other. But it ends in tragedy when Catherine chooses to marry Edgar Linton in order to live among the upper class in the society and in order to have the good life, all right? So Heathcliff comes into the society as an orphan into the family of uh, Ian Shaw, and of course, if you know the story, you discover that right from the beginning, Heathcliff does not really belong to the upper class, even though he has been adopted into an upper class family. The love that developed between Catherine and Edgar is more civilized than passionate, all right? You can understand that, you know, Edgar belongs to the upper class, uh, educated, refined, and all that. And Catherine loves him, uh, uh, does not really love him the way he, I mean, the way she loves uh, uh, Heathcliff, uh, yet Catherine loves Edgar because of the respect for the upper class and because that will give her access to uh, wealth, all right? So it's a kind of socially acceptable love but it lacks the intensity and passion, all right, uh, to replace the love earlier cultivated between Heathcliff and Catherine, a kind of love that was passionate and profound. So we are looking at these two kinds of love, the love that existed at first between Heathcliff and Catherine, and the love that somehow develops between Catherine and Edgar during her stay at, uh, uh, you know, Trush Cross Grange. Of course, that is the estate or the community that belongs to Edgar, Edgar's father, Mr. Linton, all right? So Catherine spent some time there and during that period, which of course happened coincidentally, all right, she discovers a different kind of life, you know, the life of the upper class, the beauty of that life, the, the splendor of riches. So she develops admiration for that upper class lifestyle and that informs her decision to marry Edgar instead of uh, Heathcliff, all right? So you can see a kind of betrayal uh, that occurs through Catherine. 
Now, another instance of love relationship in the novel is the one between Cathy and Linton. All right, you see Linton, of course, uh, is a multi-generational story. If you know Woodard Heights as a novel, if you have read it, you discover that, you know, Linton actually is the son of uh, Heathcliff, uh, the product between the marriage between Heathcliff and, uh, and Isabella, all right? Uh, and of course, Cathy is the daughter of Catherine. And uh, you see that the manipulative nature of Heathcliff is always at work. Don't forget that Heathcliff's marriage to Isabella is not based on love. It's not that he loves Isabella, but simply because he wants to get back at Edgar, you know, the brother to Isabella, because Edgar is the man who has taken away his, his, the love of his life, Catherine. Edgar marries Catherine, and that actually truncates the possibility of Heathcliff marrying uh, Catherine. And so because of that, uh, there is great an animosity in the heart of Heathcliff against Edgar. And so he, he actually decides to marry Isabella, pretending to love her just as a kind of revenge, you know, to get back at Edgar. And uh, then also as a clear uh, design, a grand design to actually take over the estate that belonged to Isabella's father uh, and Edgar's father. You no, know, just as she had also through scheming uh, been able to inherit the estate of Woodard Heights, all right? So now uh, the same Heathcliff has his hand in this kind of relationship that developed between Cathy and Linton, all right? So if you read the novel, you will understand. And again, you see, Linton is a kind of weakling. He's weak, he's sickly, all right? And um, so it's part of the reason Heathcliff actually despises his son, Linton. However, he has to find a way to bring Catherine's daughter, who incidentally is also Ed, Ed, uh, Edgar's daughter, to uh, in a relationship with his own son, Linton, as a way of cementing his plan. He wants to really take over uh, the estate of, um, you know, Trosh Cross Grange. So the love between uh, Cathy and Linton develops at first, it begins with sympathetic feelings because Linton gets Cathy to love him by playing on her sympathetic feelings and the need for someone to protect and help him in his weakness, you know, he's sickly. And so each time Cathy comes around uh, and, you know, takes care of him out of sympathy, you, in that way, Linton actually lets her know that he really, really desires always to be with her and coupled with the fact that you know, Heathcliff wants this to happen. He wants to actually orchestrate this. He wants to actualize this. He wants to bring Cathy into a marriage with, um, with Linton. So finally, we, we find the love between Cathy and Harriton, which develops with passion like that of Catherine and Heathcliff. You see, uh, Heathcliff. So we find that Cathy later, uh, you know, gets in, in love, falls in love with Harriton. Harriton, don't forget, is um, actually uh, Hindley's son, all right? So, and uh, the difference is that the love between these two does not get betrayed and it does not turn destructive like that of Catherine and Heathcliff. And of course, um, for one reason or the other, Heathcliff uh, does not really, out of brutality, uh, ruin 
the lives of the two love beds, all right? So uh, that's another instance of love. So we have seen love existing between different characters in this novel. First, between Heathcliff and Catherine. Secondly, between Cathy and Linton. And then we see that between Cathy and Harriton. So we can see that love and passion can be seen as a dominant theme, one of the major themes of this novel. Now, this brings us to the next major theme of the novel, which is abuse and aggression. Very uh, predominant theme in the novel. Let's look at the details, all right? Now, after the death of Mr. Ian Shaw, Hindley, who inherits the estate, becomes abusive toward Heathcliff, treating him as a servant and flogging him for any misdeed. Now, you, if, you, if you have read the novel, you will understand that when Mr. Ian Shaw was alive, uh, after bringing Heathcliff from the bush, so to say, because, you know, this is an orphan and nobody actually knows, uh, you know, where Heathcliff, uh, you know, his, his origin. Uh, that is, he, he doesn't belong to Woodland Heights anyway, to that extent we can say his origin is not known. So he comes into the family of Ian Shaw as an adopted child. And Ian Shaw throughout his life treats Heathcliff as his own son and gives him all the privileges of a member of the family. And during this time, Hindley, his biological son, is really not happy about that situation because he doesn't see Heathcliff as, as, a, a, as his biological brother. And he wants to always show the difference that he is the biological son of Mr. Henshaw and Heathcliff cannot, uh, cannot uh, be a competitor or a rival in that estate, all right? So when eventually Mr. Henshaw dies, Hindley becomes the boss, the owner of Woodarin Heights. And so he now uh, abuses Heathcliff by treating him as a servant, flogging him for any misdeed. Unlike his father who has treated Heathcliff as his son, Hindley turns Heathcliff into a manual laborer and deprive him of access to education. You know, the curate or the tutor is the custodian or the provider of education, all right? So uh, let's say Hindley stops Heathcliff's education and, uh, and treats him as a manual laborer for him to work on the farms, all right? So that is exactly what happens. And this is one instance of abuse. And this actually triggers other abuses that we follow. In his bid to avenge the evils meted out to him by the upper class, you know, of course, Hindley belongs to the upper class. Upper class here in Woodarin Heights is always determined by beds. If you are born into the, a rich family, you know, then you, you grow up to become a member of the upper class. If you are born into the family of a servant, like uh, Nelly, or you are likely also to grow up as you know a servant to serve the upper class. All right, so that is the way it has been. And so Hindley, who belongs to the upper class, has actually abused and maltreated Heathcliff. Now Heathcliff wants to avenge. He wants to retaliate against these evils or against the, those who whom he perceived to have done evil to him. So Heathcliff himself becomes abusive and aggressive. Now, let's look at him. Many thanks for watching today's video. A big thank you to all of you out there for being part of this episode. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, kindly subscribe to this channel. Subscribe now. The way of giving us support for notification about.
has new videos, videos. Start click start on the bell icon you will find the bell icon click on it so that whenever a new video is uploaded you will be instantly notified it's because if you have actually enjoyed the video like and share the video with your friends and relatives this is very important if you have any comments leave your comments below any questions any suggestions we will gladly receive them and respond promptly and positively to them see you in the next video i look forward to always see you in the new video thank you and remain blessed of their culture. So when uh, uh, Heathcliff, uh, he, when he turns into a vindictive person, he loses his sympathy, even for animals. He has no, no love, no consideration for anybody, even for animals. So apart from maltreating his wife, Isabella, he decides to hang her dog. And after doing that, he doesn't even show any remorse for that cruel action. Instead, he brags about it when there is an argument between him and Isabella. All right, so that is another instance of, uh, of uh, abuse, you know, abuse. And you can see this is, uh, this is abuse, wife abuse, animal abuse, you know, on the part of Heathcliff. And there is, a dimension to violence in each case. Now, in his vindictiveness as well, Heathcliff maltreats Harriton by depriving him of family privileges and treating him like a laborer. Don't forget that Harriton is Hindley's son, and Hindley, uh, you know, is the one who actually, after the death of Mr. Inshaw, uh, and inherits the family estate. He now maltreats Heathcliff, turns him into a laborer, and deprives him of formal education. So when Heathcliff rises to a, a high position in the society through his manipulative activities, all right, and uh, at that point, Hindley has lost his estate, and uh, Heathcliff has taken over. It is his turn now to pounce on Hindley's son, Harriton, to extend that abuse to him, all right? So that is exactly another in, uh, instance of abuse and aggression. Now, ironically, we find Heathcliff extending the same brutality to his own son, Linton, but for a different reason, all right? Heathcliff hates his son because he's weak. His son is weak and face skin. And of course, he, 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 his son's appearance reminds him of his dead wife, Isabella, who he didn't seem to like at all, all right? So you, you can see the character of Heathcliff that, you know, a lot of psychological and moral damage has been done to him as a result of the abuse he himself has suffered uh, growing up in that society, all right? So he himself turns into an abusive person. And you can see that this novel is still valid for today's society. Today in various societies, we, we still witness situations where abuse gives birth to abuse. Children from abusive homes, broken homes, also turn out to be abusive to their spouses, all right? so. That is exactly a very important theme uh, uh, expressed or explored in this work of art. That brings us to the next major theme of Wuthering Heights, and that is revenge. We have indirectly referred to it when talking about abuse and aggression. But let's look at it uh, quite directly. Now, revenge is a dominant theme of Wuthering Heights, no doubt about it. 
Uh, this is because the desire to revenge provides the motivation for most of the events of the novel. You know, the main character, Heathcliff, most of his actions are based on his desire to revenge, all right? So Heathcliff's frustration and vengefulness is rooted in his being betrayed by Catherine, the woman he loves so passionately. Now, the, a, another reason is the mistreatment he receives from Hindley and Edgar, you know, uh, Edgar, uh, of course. Then uh, we also see that, um, you know, when Heathcliff rises to prominence, he decides to take revenge against unjust treatments meted out to him by the rich class. Uh, Catherine, of course, belongs to the rich class. And don't forget, it's because of her desire to retain her position in that upper class uh, that she, she chooses to marry Edgar instead of Heathcliff. Uh, so we have a situation where Catherine, in the depth of her heart, loves uh, Heathcliff. But in her head, you know, reason, uh, you know, the opinion of the society eventually prevails. And so in her head, she chooses to marry Edgar uh, because that is acceptable to the society and because that will give her access to, her, to the position an enviable position of the upper class and the wealth that they possess, all right? So uh, as a result of this, and knowing that all these have happened to him, uh, uh, Mr. Heathcliff, because of his poor background. And so when he now rises to prominence, it is now, he believes it is now his turn to get his pound of flesh, you know? And the same uh, uh, situation happens. This is a, a, a this is a common among human beings that people, when they are in uh, their poor estate, they have taken record of how the rich and the highly privileged have treated them. And so, when they also rise to prominence, they become vindictive. It happens very often in different societies. Now, after disappearing from the moors and acquiring a mysterious fortune, Heathcliff comes back to an alcoholic uh, Hindley and wishes to help him out of his gambling, gambling debts. So you see, we have other themes to explore. Don't forget that what brings uh, Hindley down is alcoholism. That is also one of the themes. And gambling too is part of it because that is what eventually gives uh, the room for uh, for Mr. Heathcliff. I mean Heathcliff to actually take over the family estate from Hindley. All right. So by lending Hindley money that they cannot pay back, Hindley, uh, Heathcliff in turn gets the Woodland Heights plantation. He takes over that plantation. So by taking Hindley's inheritance, Heathcliff is able to get his revenge for Hindley's past mistreatments against him. So if that is part of the revenge. Heathcliff also goes ahead to deny Harriton, Hindley's son, formal education in the same way as Hindley had done to him. So this is uh, revenge here. So you, I hope this is clear to you when discussing revenge as a dominant theme of Woodhouse, these ins these instances have to be cited from the novel because you cannot uh, discuss any theme of a work of art without referring to evidence in that work of art. And so we have been able to give copious examples to prove that revenge is indeed a dominant team in Wuthering Heights. Now, there's another instance that proves also uh, this revenge. When he pretends to love Isabella and eventually elopes with her, his real motive is to hurt Edgar and to avenge himself against Catherine's marrying Edgar. 
Linton, whom he hates. So you see, every action he has taken uh, from that point in his life has always been based on the desire to revenge. So revenge is a central theme of Wood Allen Heights. So Heathcliff's decision to marry Isabella is also a way of positioning himself to take over her father's estate, Trush Cross Grange, all right? Okay, so now that brings us to another dominant team, and that is the team of social class. You will see that we had, or we, even in the course of our discussion so far, we have made references to the upper class, to the less privileged class, to the poor class. So in Wood and Heights, we have the upper class uh, in which you have rich families, like the families of Mr. and Mrs. Ian, uh, Ian Shaw, the families of Mr. and Mrs. Linton at Crush Garden. You, these people belong to the upper society. Then we have servants like Nelly, who, have, who has been serving one generation, one family, the one generation of that family uh, to another. All right, she has remained a servant throughout her uh, life. Uh, span in this novel, all right? Then we have uh, Heathcliff who also uh, is brought in as an adopted child. And of course, is later on the of the privileges of the upper class society family. Now, social class has to do with divisions in society based on economic and social status. People in the same social class, you know, normally they have the same privileges. They have enormous wealth. They are highly educated. The type of job they have, the type of income, the estates they own, they own the land and all that. So uh, then we have the people who are the servants or the working class people like Nelly and so on. All right. So in the novel, Woodarin Heights, uh, Bronte raises the issue of social class by showing how Heathcliff an adopted child is treated in his new society, Woodarin Heights, where one's social class determines how one is regarded by other members of the society. Yes, although in the lifetime of Mr. Ian Shaw, uh, Heathcliff enjoys the privileges of uh, a member of that upper class family, yet we find a reversal of fortune for Heathcliff the moment his, uh, his uh, uh, adopted, adoptive father dies, right? Then, and uh, he, uh, let's say, yes, um, what's his name now? Hindley uh, takes over as the owner of Woodarden Heights. We see a reversal of fortune. Uh, Heathcliff is demoted, degraded into the lower class society he is treated as a laborer, as a mother laborer. He's also denied formal education. All right, so social class is portrayed in the novel as a major cause of divisions between characters. For example, we see that there's a division between Hindley and Heathcliff, even though they are, their father's original intention is for Heathcliff to be a member of the family, like Hindley, yet we see that because of class consciousness, Hindley degrades Heathcliff and treats him as a manual laborer as a way of showing that Heathcliff does not belong to the same upper class that he, Hindley, belongs to. So it is all about class, social class. Then we find Heathcliff and, and uh, Catherine as another example of you know, how the upper class as a cause of division in society is portrayed. You know, we find that Heathcliff and Catherine cannot marry because of Heathcliff's degraded class status. Uh, don't forget that Heathcliff has been degraded by Hindley uh, uh, to the low class position. And then this is why Catherine chooses to marry Edgar Linton. It is because Edgar belongs to a higher social class in terms of wealth 
and Heathcliff belongs to the low class. So this makes it, this becomes an obstacle. Even though Catherine loves Heathcliff with all her heart, if you if you have read about the the the, the story of their love and their passion and their deep profound fondness for each other, you discover that at the initial stage, Catherine has regarded Heathcliff as her own life. You know that Heathcliff is her life, and they belong to each other. And in fact, they see to uh, they see them each other, uh, both of them as sharing one life. Yet, because of this class consciousness, uh, Catherine chooses to marry Edgar, who belongs to the upper class. And so, even though her heart is yearning and clamoring for Heathcliff, yet he, she has to uh, shut her feelings out and marry Edgar because of social class. So we see class acting as a major obstacle and keeping true lovers apart until the end of the novel. It becomes impossible for these two people who have loved each other so passionately to actually uh, consummate their love. Their love is betrayed and it is unfulfilled because of social class consciousness. So that is an evidence that social class is one of the major themes of Wuthering Heights. Now, let's also look at Wuthering Heights and its setting. Wuthering Heights is set in the 19th century Britain when people were born into a class and stayed there. If you have studied English history, of course, I read uh, English literary history. And of course, I treated a lot of literary works uh, set in the in Britain and specifically in London of that uh, Victorian period, the Victorian era. Uh, so you see, this social class consciousness is a serious issue uh, when it comes to the British uh, society. If you your parents were rich and respected like Edgar's own, then you are likely to also grow up to uh, have the same status, accorded the same status, all right? You belong to the aristocracy, all right? Now, if your parents were servants like Nelly Deans, they probably would also remain a servant. So there is this clear cut class division and class consciousness. And so uh, it is a dominant theme in most novels of this period of British literary history. Now, when Heathcliff comes back rich, he manipulates his way into taking over the estates of Woodaring Heights and Trush Crush Grind, thereby causing significant changes to the idea of social class in these communities. Oh, don't forget that he, he grows up from his youth uh, as somebody degraded, all right? Of course, he does not biologically belong to the upper class a family, uh, having been adopted, and after the death of his adoptive father, he loses his privileges and he's degraded. Now, all the uh, injustices, all the unjust treatments, abuses that uh, have been meted out to him have been based on this class consciousness. And so when he also rises to acquire wealth in a mysterious way, and he comes back to this community. It's, he believes it's his time to also show that he belongs to the upper class. After all, what gives you uh, that uh, audacity, uh, that, that power, that authority, is that you have wealth. And so uh, having come back with wealth, which actually is what places you uh, on, on, the, on top of the social ladder. Heathcliff now uh, is ready for his own upper class uh, wicked actions, if I may put it that way. 
So his brutal actions against other characters are based on his need to get revenge on the upper class for their unjust treatments to him when he was among the less privileged class in that society. And so uh, social class has always been a, a, major, a major social issue because it has become, it has been the defining factor of people's behavior, people's actions and reactions in, in society. And so even in today's society, social class consciousness becomes the underlining uh, motives of a lot of people in their actions and reactions, all right? So now this brings us to conflict as another major theme in Wuthering Heights. Conflict, all right? You know what conflict is? Uh, in literature, conflict could be, a, you know, a antagonistic behavior, you know, uh, you know, or confrontation, if you like, between characters. But it's not in all cases that conflict can be defined in that way. Conflict can also be the major problem, the trauma, the, the dilemma, all right? Uh, the predicament faced by a major character in a work of art. Uh, but we are treating conflict here from the perspective of what conflict is in real life. Life actually cannot be completely uh, devoid of conflict. Conflict is a part of life, a part of human life, all right? So whenever you find a work of art, you need to look out for conflict, either conflict between characters or internal conflict within characters, all right? So now, conflict is inevitable. How you respond to conflict is what makes or mass your life. That is a fact of life, undeniably. Now, from childhood, we find Heathcliff facing barriers to success in life, being an adopted orphan, having to face discrimination from his adoptive brother, Hindley, and so on and so forth. So we find that Heathcliff himself faces conflict in in his life as he grows up. Don't forget that Heathcliff is a human being, is a character, and so his life is, is, a, is, is something that we can study and is also relatable because we see a lot of people grow up in society in similar circumstances, and some grow up and they are eventually, you know, positively, uh, uh, impacted by what happened. Yet some people are affected adversely as we see in the case of Heathcliff, all right? So initially Heathcliff seems to respond positively to his life conflicts. And how does he do this? His great, nat his great natural abilities, his strength of character and his love for Catherine Earnshaw uh, actually propel him to do something about his situation, to raise himself from his humble beginnings to the status of a wealthy gentleman. Don't forget it is in anger, you know, in, in his anger, when he looks at what is happening to him because of his situation, he has to find a way to overcome this conflict, these, these factors, these barriers to his success. And he rises to the occasion he disappears from Woodarden Heights, and when he reappears, he has made it in life, all right? However, we see other things. In the end, he allows the desire to revenge himself for Hindley's abuse and Catherine's betrayal. All this leads him to a twisted life of cruelty. You, we see a distortion of his moral life. He loses his, his values, those good values, that human beings are noted for, like kindness for fellow human beings and uh, good treatment of animals and so on and so forth, you know, and, uh, and the respect for relationship and for marriage. He all this lose value for Heathcliff, uh, Heathcliff rather. 
So because of his, uh, because of what he has suffered in life, you know, this brings us to the theme of revenge, which we have already discussed. So you see that uh, it is the conflict that he has suffered in his life that eventually brings him to the point where he decides to revenge. You see how you react to the conflicts of life can make or mark your destiny. Now let's take a look at another example. We see a uh, Catherine that when she makes the choice that she eventually makes, a choice to marry Edgar for money rather than marrying uh, Heathcliff for the love she has for him. If we discover that this also leads to an uh, internal crisis in the life of Catherine. You see, she suffered a lot of psychological trauma that eventually, you know, affects her mentally. Of course, she, she eventually dies, uh, you know, uh, probably when it's not really her natural time to die. She dies while giving birth to her daughter, all right? So it's also an instance of conflict. So we have conflict. We can also see internal conflict in the life of Hindley. Hindley is somebody who has this amazing opportunity, having uh, inherited this large estate from his father, Mr. Ian Shaw, we see that he has some internal conflict, alcoholism. You, you see, these, these addictions become the, 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 the factor that eventually destroy his life. Uh, the addic his addiction to alcohol and his addiction to gambling, all this conspire to reduce him and demote him from the landlord of, uh, of uh, Woodarden Heights to a, a, a chronic debtor who eventually loses his estate and dies eventually, all right? So these are all instances of crisis and we can look at, uh, at com as conflict, not necessarily as a physical fight between two individuals, but the internal psychological uh, trauma, or if you like, addiction. There are a lot of people who actually, uh, from their birth, have been amazingly privileged to belong to the upper class. Having been born in a rich family, you know, they have all the all the opportunities in front of them to become great in life, all right? Yet because of drug addiction, you find some of them ending up like paupers and some of them committing suicide at the end of the day. So that these are conflicts in life, all right? So it, we find such conflicts in Woodarden Heights and these are some very deep, you know, very profound things that a lot of people have not really talked about. But you look at it, you discover that that is a major theme explored in this very amazing and fascinating uh, novel by Emily Bronte. Now, conflict is depicted in this novel through the relationship that existed between Catherine and Heathcliff which eventually turns into a source of endless conflicts after Catherine's decision to marry Edgar instead. So you can see, you know, what, uh, what would have, you know, led to the, uh, the joy and, uh, and comfort and peace of these two individuals eventually leads to conflicts, you know, chains of conflicts, all right, because of betrayal and because of class consciousness and other factors that we may have, you know, referred to. All right, so then we can look at some interpersonal conflicts that, that between Hindcliff and Hindley, that between Hindcliff and Edgar, and we can find some conflicts within the family. You know, we find, we get to a point where Edgar, you know, becomes aware of, the fact that his wife, Catherine, still has feelings for Heathcliff, and that gets him mad, and sometimes he would tell uh, Catherine to take a categorical decision to choose between him 
and Heathcliff. So that also is a conflict. We can call it family crisis, if you like. Then we find also the, in, the family or domestic conflict that occurs between Heathcliff and Isabella. And this gets violent, all right? And uh, so conflict actually is treated uh, exhaustively as a prominent team in Woodarden Heights. Now the theme of death, oh, death is a universal phenomenon, all right? And of course, uh, in most works of art, we see that some of these universal ideas are explored. And uh, Woodarden Heights as a very important novel of life and family could not have overlooked this prominent theme. So the theme of death is uh, explored. Now let's look at it this way. In Woodarden Heights, a mini Bronte portrays death not only as a natural phenomenon, but also as a consequence of psychological traumas. You see? This is a multi-generational novel. So it gives us insight into the natural human history of passing from one generation to another, to a new one after the death of the original settlers. For example, we, we look at the, the characters in Woodarden Heights, the first generation of the two families. On one side, we have Mr. and Mrs. Ian Shaw, and then we have on the other side, Mr. and Mrs. LinkedIn. Now at a point, Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw, at least Mr. Earnshaw dies. And uh, then who takes over? His son Hindley. So death actually brings a new generation. And uh, then the, a similar thing happens in Mr. Linton's family. Uh, as Mr. Linton dies, then we find Edgar Linton taking over and uh, you know, managing the family, taking over the family estate with his wife, Catherine, and Hindley uh, with his wife, Francis Inshaw. All right. So we find that, you know, it, we that is portrayed as a, a, a natural process that occurs. And you look at it, it happens naturally in life that you find a family, the husband and the wife, they give birth to children and their children begin to grow up. After some time, the father and the mother die and then you have their children taken over. And this we have seen actually clearly depicted in Woodarden Heights because we see, you know, we see it uh, clearly depicted here, one generation, completing their natural race in life and handing over the baton to the next generation. Then we also find death portrayed in another uh, form. Catherine's death seems to be linked to the psychological trauma, all right? Associated with being trapped in a love triangle with Heathcliff and Edgar. You see that the moment she makes that choice, of marrying Edgar uh, for money and for social status. And uh, instead of marrying Heathcliff, whom she really passionately loves, you see, her heart seems to have truly loved Heathcliff, but her head wanted uh, to marry, uh, wanted the marriage with Edgar that would give her access to the upper class. So this situation results in mental agony that eventually affects her health. Of course, she dies while giving birth to her daughter. So we see that, you know, death here is uh, portrayed as a, a consequence. It, death can result from certain choices that people make, all right? That may affect their psychological uh, welfare. So it, it happens like that. It may not be uh, choosing who to marry. It could be habit. Look at a situation where some people have chosen uh, to smoke marijuana or to take cocaine or heroin. And uh, eventually this may affect their mental faculties and they, 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 they become 
lunatic, all right? So that actually may lead to their death. So there are a lot of things that happen, choices that people make can make or mar their life. And that is adequately portrayed in this novel. Now, again, we see that in the death of Catherine, there seems to be a new dimension to how death is portrayed. Death appears to have opened a new door to a new location, uh, as we find in the behavior of Heathcliff, who feels that Catherine is taking him with her, you know, because of his love for Catherine, you know, uh, he, 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 he sees the ghost of Catherine. He even prefers to go and be united with Catherine in death and all that. As if death is, it, it takes you to a place where you can be reunited with your, with the person you love, all right? So that also is portrayed here, all right? Now, after spending some years seeking vengeance on those around him, Heathcliff eventually joins Catherine in death. Of course, don't forget, he has even chosen to be buried in, alongside Catherine. Uh, and of course, that gives us this, um, uh, this uh, belief in uh, life after death, which also is a theme that we have to discuss uh, in this video. Now, this brings us to another instance of death portrayed. We can find that portrayed as a kind of moral degeneration where one may be alive physically, but dead morally, all right? You, you see, Heathcliff is an example of this. He is portrayed as a living dead, somebody who has lost morality, you, okay? All his emotions of kindness and compassion uh, have all eroded because of his desire to, re, uh, to, to get revenge, all right? So, and because he, he feels so bad that, uh, after being betrayed by Catherine and after uh, he has seen that Edgar has taken away the love of his life, uh, he becomes mentally unstable, all right? And even, especially after Catherine's death, Having lost hope of finding true love in real life, he believes that he can be reunited with his lover when he dies. So he arranges to be buried next to her, next to Catherine. So we see, uh, you know, death and aspects of death being portrayed in this novel. Well, having uh, looked at the theme of death, then let's look at the at belief in the afterlife, all right? This actually is an age old belief and is prevalent in different uh, societies. Uh, and it is a recurring theme in various works of art. And uh, in Wooder and Heights, we also find aspects of belief in the afterlife. Uh, belief in the afterlife is that is believing that someone even after dying physically, his or her soul or her ghost or her spirit is still alive. That is belief in the afterlife, all right? And it is portrayed in this piece of literature. Now, belief in the afterlife is portrayed in the novel through ghosts and spirits. We find that uh, uh, dead characters, please, portrayed as coming back to heart, haunt the living. For example, we find Heathcliff repeatedly desiring visitations from the ghost of his beloved Catherine. He even digs up her grave in order to be closer to her. Here, ghosts and spirits are used as symbols to stress the intensity of the love that existed between Heathcliff and Catherine, all right? Then the constant reference to ghosts in the novel gives insight into the belief system of the British society of that period. Now you can also, even in the Shakespearean era, uh, you will find also ghosts becoming characters in some of Shakespeare's uh, plays, all right? So it, it, uh, it has been part of that uh, British society and it's really not surprising that this belief is also being portrayed 
in Wudaren Heights. Ghosts are spirits used to represent souls, memory, and the past, all right? Uh, so these symbols are used to portray some important themes such as love and obsession, good and evil, which are believed to have far-reaching effects on human destinies. Uh, Curtis ghost, for example, disturbs Heathcliff based on the memory, you know, that Heathcliff had, you know, of the past he shared with Catherine. Don't forget that a time, there was a time in their life when these two persons existed, just like one entity, uh, each loved the other as his or her own soul. And so uh, Catherine would regard Heathcliff as, you know, as her life, and uh, Heathcliff would regard Catherine as his life. So when people are so emotionally attached to each other, of course, you see that memories are powerful. And uh, sometimes, you know, this give birth to manifestations, uh, supernatural manifestations. Uh, when you love somebody so passionately, if the person passes on, sometimes you see, see the person in your dreams. But this is extraordinary in the sense that it's not just made dreams, but you find Heathcliff actually uh, uh, believing that uh, Petrin's ghost is alive and is coming and you know, he cherishes her presence and all that. So that is a very predominant theme in this novel. Now, belief in the afterlife is evident in Cliff's conversation with Nelly, uh, in which he confides in Nelly that he believes in ghosts. Uh, of course, Heathcliff uh, emphasizes that, you know, the, the ghost of Kat Catherine is real, all right? He believes it. He has no doubt whatsoever. And Lockwood also uh, has some encounter with that when he visits the house. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prevailing belief of that society. Now, Heathcliff insists that the dead are not annihilated. So this is belief in the afterlife. He believes that people don't die. They may die physically, but there's the real which in, in, you know, is believed to be the soul of the person is still alive, all right? And this highlights the belief in life after death as a predominant theme of the novel, all right? So this brings us to the end of today's video. You will agree with me that we, this, less, this lesson is not exhaustive because we still have so many other uh, themes of wood art and heights. For example, we have not been able to discuss the theme of marriage, all right? The, the, the theme of, um, of uh, alcoholism, the theme of gambling, even though these are minor themes, uh, we have not been able to talk about the theme of domestic violence and so on and so forth, the theme of, um, uh, civilization versus, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, well, uh, let's say rural life, if you like, because we see aspects of wood and heights, what, uh, uh, where you see the forest and all that. So that kind of life is portrayed in this particular novel. And there are a number, ownership. Ownership is also a, a dominant theme, ownership, because a lot is about ownership and all the manipulative tendencies and actions of, uh, and he, of Heathcliff are actually motivated by his desire to take over ownership of Wuthering Heights, which eventually actualizes, and that of uh, Thrush Cross Grange, all right? The ownership, not only of physical estates, but even ownership and the sense of belonging when it, it comes to who becomes your wife, all right? So, and uh, a lot of other themes. Uh, so watch out for a sequel to this video where we discuss other uh, important themes uh, of Wuthering Heights. But so far, so good. We have been able to discuss 
seven major themes of Udaran Heights, uh, as you can see, love and passion, abuse and aggression, revenge, social class, conflict, the theme of death, belief in the afterlife. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure you like the video and share it with your friends and relations. If you have anybody who is preparing for any English exam, where questions on Woodarden Heights are expect, expected, then you will do them a great favor if you share this video with them. Those who are preparing to sit the West African Senior School Certificate Examination, the National Examinations Council, Senior School Certificate Examination, NAPTEP, and a whole lot of other similar exams where this is a text. Of course, uh, you will do them a great service if you share this video with them, okay? If you have not yet subscribed to this channel, this is also the appropriate time for you to hit the subscribe button. Make sure you click on the bell icon as well so that whenever a new video goes live on this channel, you will be notified instantly. You can visit our website, English Classes Online, www.englishclassesonline.com.ng. There you will find a lot of resources. Uh, so if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. Find time to browse through the entire channel. You will find a lot of related videos, not only on uh, literary analysis, but also on various areas of proficiency in the use of English. I want to say a big thank you to all of you for being part of today's episode. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Goodbye for now and remain blessed. Many thanks for watching today's video. A big thank you to all of you out there for being part of today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, kindly subscribe to this channel. Subscribe now as a way of giving us support. For notification about new videos, click on the bell icon. You will find the bell icon. Click on it so that whenever a new video is uploaded, you will be instantly notified. If you have actually enjoyed the video, like and share the video with your friends and relatives. This is very important. If you have any comments, leave your comments below. Any questions, any suggestions, we would gladly receive them and respond promptly and positively to them. See you in the next video. I look forward to always seeing you in the new video.